Welcome back to Cards and Comics. Today I am going to do a price analysis of the 1950s Baseball Hall of Fame rookie cards. That's right, every Hall of Fame rookie card from the 50s. Compare prices from one year ago to today and do some further analysis of 1950s Hall of Fame rookie cards compared to 1960 Hall of Fame rookie cards. So let's get right into it. So the first thing I always do is I create this kind of index. So 2021 versus 2022, um, you know, in different grades. So I chose five, six, seven, and eight. And so I'm going to create indexes for all those grades and all those players. And, you know, here I've got some interesting, um, you know, cards to point out. Cards that went way up in value and cards that went way down. And I have a summary of that on another um, slide here, but... And just in general, you'll see the PSA 6 Whitey Ford, the PSA 7 Monty Irvin, um, the Mini Minoso 52 Tops. And again, Mini Minoso is a new Hall of Famer, so it makes sense for his cards to go up. Hoy Wilhelm, the 52 uh, Tops PSA 5, and the PSA 8 Eddie Matthews 52 Tops. Now, cards that went way down. Surprisingly, the PSA 5. Um, Mickey Mantle Bowman rookie card the 52 tops six Hoyt Wilhelm so the five went way up six went way down doesn't make a lot of sense but we'll talk about some of this the Ernie Banks PSA 7 the PSA 8s of again Hoyt Wilhelm and Willie Mees uh, went down by quite a bit over 30 percent so those are some cards to think about as we move into some other analysis some further information but here is just kind of how everything laid out and I, I kind of averaged the entire, you know, if you had a complete run of five, six, seven, and eights for each player to get, give an average gain or loss. So that is on this chart. If you want to pause it and look at it, you can. Um, and I'm going to move on to the next slide. So if I go summary by grade, and I did it two ways. I did the percent change in value, but I also just did total money loss or gain. Um, because... I think the money to me is more important. Like the average gain or loss could, you know, get skewed uh, how you look at the cards. And um, you could have a massive gain on a little bit of money or a massive loss on a little bit of money that could skew that overall change number. But in total dollars um, is really what, you know, you should look at in terms of was it a good investment or bad. So if you had the entire run of 50s Hall of Fame rookie cards and PSA 5, you would have lost $347 on average. If you sold them all, bought them all in 21 and sold them all in 22 as of October uh, time period. Uh, if you had PSA 6s, you would have gained $859 on average or in total. Uh, PSA 7, you would have lost $419. And a PSA 8, you would have lost close to $3,000. Overall, on average, you would have lost $700 if you would have had um, a PSA 5, 6, 7, and 8 set of Hall of Fame rookie cards. Now, if you had all those cards, you'd be probably sitting on a lot of money too. So, um, you know, a $700 total loss over a year over year, to me, that's pretty flat. The only movement really that was interesting was the PSA 8. Um, but again, those cards are so much more valuable. That's not a huge movement um, for cards that expensive. Now, PSA 6 was the big winner. And again, I've said this in multiple videos. I think the PSA 6 grade is definitely that grade in between high and low grade so seven and eights is when people really consider a card high grade in the 50s that might shift down one notch to where you can say a psa 6 is still is now high grade i still think a lot of collectors especially registry correct collectors view the six and in betweener definitely a lot of collectors would think of five four uh, five and below is kind of where the mid tier to low tier starts so that six is still that value grade i think a lot of people love the six because it still looks nice and you get some good deals and you can see you saw some growth in the 1950s baseball card hall of fame rookie index now moving on to again the players with the biggest increases all grades dollar wise the eddie matthews um definitely blew everything else away we'll get into it but the clue here is going to be low pop low pop is a reason why a lot of these cards are either very expensive uh, for players that aren't iconic i think eddie matthews is a very good player but i don't consider him hank aaron or even ernie banks so he was a good player but his 52 tops is incredibly rare 
and high grade. So that makes sense where he would get a huge increase on like the PSA A grade, which we saw. 54 tops, Hank Aaron. Um, $1,000 increase on average uh, for all grades. Okay. Not a huge percent change, but in just total dollars. And again, that's why I talked about, you know, the Monty Irvin moved 41% the next card down, but it was $300 because again, his cards are not worth quite as, or as near as much as Hank Aaron. Um, again, we talked about Mini Minoso, new Hall of Famer. His cards went up on average by $286, which is a good increase for a player like Minoso, whose cards are not that expensive. Al Kaline um, was a surprise on the list. Um, you know, a little bit of movement there. But outside of Aaron and Matthews, no dollar movement over $1,000. Um, and again, there's a lot of cards in this index, and you're only looking at a few cards that uh, moved above $200. Now, as far as decreases, um, you know, the, this was the shocking one to me, honestly, but as I think about it, obviously these cards had the biggest amount of uh, money to lose dollar wise. So I if I'm ranking in my dollars, but I go by percentage, you see a lot of percentages are five to 10%, you know, or below 10% for, you know, for a collectible for something that um, you're invested in for a year, losing five or 7% is not the end of the world. It's almost flat in my opinion. So that amount of money could be made up on just the fact the copy could be really nice. So you could have bought a really nice copy and still sell for more money today than a year ago because there's a Delta built in around how nice the cards are. So again, you know, not, I wouldn't consider the, the, the Mantle, the Clemente or the banks to be uh, a big you know shock in terms of just that they went down uh, dollar wise, since they are worth so much money, obviously it looks very big. But to me, you know, if you had a very nice copy, you might still be at flat or could make money. So not as scary as it looks. The Willie Mays was a little shocking. And again, the, you know, the big 50, you know, the PSA 8, 51 Bowman was your big uh, loser there. Card went up tremendously high in value and then came back down um, like a lot of cards did. But the fact that Willie Mays cards, in my opinion, were so undervalued before uh, the 2020, 2019 period that I thought they might stick a little bit uh, instead of this dramatic drop. And they really didn't. And I think that's disappointing uh, for me uh, because I feel like Willie Mays was so much of a better player than Mickey Mantle and pretty much the best player of the 50s. Uh, because again, Ted Williams didn't play uh, <laughs> throughout the entire 50s. So. I think Willie Mays definitely has that uh, ability to say he was one of the best players of the 50s and 60s. If you had the 60s in, definitely better than Mantle. 50s, you could make some argument for Mantle, but 60s, definitely Willie Mays was the better player. So again, I feel like, um, you know, I was hoping that his cards would stick there. But again, it was driven a lot by that big 51 Bowman PSA. And we'll go back and look at it. You can see that card dropped from... 234,000 down to 162. So that's a 70 something thousand dollar loss in value. And that drove that average um, to be $20,000 on average. So, um, so one of the things I want to talk about again was pop counts and how pop counts are really something you should look at. The thing that I want you to think about when um, looking at pop counts between 50s and 60s Hall of Famers, because we're going to talk about 60s as well, is the fact that. The PSA 7 and 8 pop count of 50s Hall of Famers is so much lower than 60s. Um, and we'll talk about it in a minute, you know, compared to 60s. But you can see that there's a lot of 50s Hall of Famers with pop counts below 100 and below 200, which is very low. I look for most modern cards. So let's say from the 60s on to have a PSA population count of around 10 to 15% of the total pop. That would be considered a card that's somewhat hard to get in a PSA gate. And you can see most of these cards have, have seven and eight rates below 10%. Some of them, you know, the Eddie Matthews is below 5%. There's just 14 PSA gates. Crazy low number for that card, but look at Ernie Banks, look at Roberto Clemente. Cards have been submitted at super high rates because they're so valuable. 
with very low pop counts, 123 PSA 8s, 340 PSA 7s for Clemente, only 280 PSA 7s for Ernie Banks. Those are low numbers. And then look at the 51 Bowman Mantle, just incredibly low numbers. And the Maze card isn't that much higher, you know, at that 9.2 or just, you know, 24 more 8s, but only six more 7s. So again, you know, the pop count on 50s Hall of Famers is really, really low. And if you compare the increases and decreases, you'll see that on the increase side, the Eddie Matthews, because of that low pop count, was very similar or very understandable why that went up so much. Now, the 51 Bowman Mano and Mays, they're very low pop counts. The Clemente is a very low pop count. The 52 Hoyt Wilhelm, there's only 54 seven or eights and 74 sevens. It's a pretty hard card. And the Ernie Banks is again, pretty hard card. So would I panic if I own those cards? No, I talked about the percentages are low. And so it's in some cases it almost, I consider flat. Um, and they're low pop counts. Those are the cards I would always recommend you invest in. If you're going to invest, if you're going to buy cards to hold, to go up in value over time, these cards are going to be the cards hard to find. They, they're very popular. They get submitted a lot, but don't get converted very often into sevens or eights. So again, if you can buy high grade cards in the fifties and sixties of hall of fame, rookie cards, sevens and eights are to me, the investment grade cards. Nines are high roller sixes are again, viewed by collectors as kind of the in-between grade and they're, awesome and you're they're going up you know i showed you where the 60s are going up so that's still a really safe bet five start that mid grade to, to the to the decline to the low grade and again those cards are not as stable as the sixes but your real potential for growth is the seven and eights if you're going to really want to see maybe some explosive growth in the card value just because of these low pop counts now when we compare them to the 60s um it becomes super apparent how much rarer 50 Hall of Fame rookie cards are than 60s. When I talk about that 10% rule, um, you know, it becomes very apparent. You can see that there is not a single um, 60s Hall of Fame rookie card with the pop count below 100. You can see that there's not a single um, PSA 8 50s Hall of Fame rookie card with the pop count over 400. So you'll see tons of cards on the 60s list above 400 in the eight slot. Um, a lot in the 500s, some in the thousands. So again, or thousand. Um, so again, that's a magnitude issue, right? It's a pretty good magnitude. Now, um, if I look at cards like the Yastrzemski and the McCovey, what I'm looking at on those cards is the total amount of cards graded for those players and the amount of eights is below a 10% conversion. So that's what I look for when I look at is a hall of fame rookie card in an, or any card, um, from the sixties, fifties and seventies, you know, if it has that below 10% eight conversion, cause I buy a lot of eights, you know, those are the cards I tend to pay attention to and, and tend to, to be cards I look at. So you got the 62 Gaylord Perry and Lou Brock, the 60 Yaz and McCovey. And again, that fits into the set too. The 62 set, the 60 set are a little harder to find in eights than other years. 63 the same way. The Pete Rose is below 10%. And then you've got the Jackson and Ryan. But those are to me a little more red herring. When you get in the 70s and the 68 and 69 set are much more heavily printed than some earlier top sets in the 60s, what you have to look at is maybe that number should be closer to 5% conversion, you know, like to be considered a low pop because um, they're printed so heavily compared to other years that you just got a massive amount of people just sending those cards in. Now, Nolan Ryan and Reggie Jackson are worth a lot of money in PSA twos and threes and fours and fives. So that total pop count is much higher. So again, that 10% conversion may not really fit cards from the sixties and seventies. Maybe it has to be 5%, not 10. Now, if you look at just why, you know, um, that pop count matters is because it converts over into price. So 
Average price of a PS8 Hall of Famer from the 50s is around $50,000 compared to the 60s, which is around $2,200. So again, we're talking a huge magnitude because you've got, obviously, Mantle and Maze. Even taking out the Mantle, it's around $30,000. So again, uh, order of magnitude bigger than 10x. So if you just put the, you know, the uh, Matthews and the Clemente and the Koufax and the, the Maze card... It still blows the 60s out of the water. And just look at average pop count for the 50s and 60s. You know, it's basically um, 2 to 3x for almost everything except for total graded. There's only a 1,000 card difference between total graded. But you can see the PSA 8 is basically one-third uh, for, for an 8 from the 50s compared to the 60s. And it's basically half of what it, the amount is from the 50s to the 60s. So it's disproportionate. You know, it's not the same. So even if more 50s cards get graded, you're not going to get pop counts close to the 60s. The cards are easier to grade. They're in better condition. They were kept probably better. Uh, you've got different methodologies of, of distribution. You've got presentation sets. You've got, you know, um, you know, vending at some point happening. So again different ways of cards to be distributed that made the cards maybe have better condition. So that makes, you know, um, this idea of when I talk about in my videos, when I talk about, I really want to focus on 1950s hall of famers, 1950s rookie cards. It's because of this factor that I've got a lot of sixties cards and that makes sense because they're so much easier to find and get, uh, compared to fifties. Um, and last, but not least here, I wanted to talk about um, this idea of the amount of PSA 8 rookie cards from the 60s that are under $1,000. I had this in my 60s video. And if you look at it, it's a pretty long list. There's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 players from the 60s. There's only one card from the 50s of a Hall of Fame rookie card that's below $1,000. And it is Bill Mazeroski. Now, Bill Maz is very comparable in his uh, war career to a player like uh, Orlando Cepeda. Um, you know, and so, you know, very similar in his career numbers to uh, Jim Hunter. Better than Raleigh Fingers. Um, but he's on that lower end of the Hall of Fame list. I understand that. I'm a pirate collector. I get it. He's not... You know, Nolan Ryan, he's not, you know, um, Clemente, he's not Mays. But, you know, he's still a 50s Hall of Fame rookie card. And if you look at pricing, he's only one below $1,000. So I do think that gives you some insight on some ways to invest. And again, I put this list up last time when I looked at, you know, cards I might look at, you know, from a Hall of Fame rookie card perspective. And looked at pop count, looked at, you know, war, career, average per year. You know, to give you some idea of how good the player was, the pop counts, you know, so if you're going to target one of these guys, you know, target something like the Phil Necro, which you look at is got a pretty high career war along with a pretty low pop count. That makes a lot of sense. You may want to go after a player like that who's not quite as popular. So that card might be considered undervalued in a few years when people look at who is truly a, a great player. You know, now Mazeroski doesn't have near the war or um, the value, but he is a 50s Hall of Fame rookie card. I think, honestly, that card is going to hit $1,000 at some point. It's going to. It's just 50s Hall of Fame rookie cards are just hard to find. Um, and I think eventually all of them will be worth $1,000 just because of that uh, rarity. Just because, you know, just by grading more of them, you know, if another 500 Mazes come into the market, graded there's going to be basically another two you know three eights you know maybe out of all those cards because all the good ones have been graded i think you know for the most part and you're not going to find a ton more you know uh, seven eights and nines so again you know these are the cards i would look at to be maybe undervalued maybe targets for acquiring if you think about a card that might go up in value over time um and again it's just an idea it's not i'm not saying you should do this but you know, if you were asking me like cards I might target, well, this would be the list I would probably target. Um, so again, um, you know, this is, you know, 
what I'm trying to do, you know, when I look at um, the data and present it to you guys, hopefully you like it. Uh, let me know how you think that I should be doing this a little differently. Some other analysis you'd like to see me do. But this is my 50s uh, Hall of Fame rookie card analysis. Um, you know, the prices, how they've changed year over year. And then how they kind of compare to the 60s, because that's something I always think about myself, you know, like, because uh, I always talk about buying 50s cards. You know, I, I wish I was doing more often, but they're just not as available. And this is why. So there it is, guys. That's my 50s Hall of Fame rookie card update, along with a bonus comparison to the 60s. Hope you like it, and I'll see you next time on Cards and Comics. Bye.